Welcome back to the rules of fun. I'm the Madcap Gamer, and today we are going to be looking at the classic card trick-taking game Euchre. And all we're going to need is this one deck of cards. So stick around. Yuka is a trick-taking game that has been around for around 200 years, which means the rules change depending on where you are and who you've learnt them from. It's a game for four players split into two teams, and the rules can get a little bit complicated when you first sit down to explain them. So today we're going to break them up into the setup, the card rules, playing around, and scoring. And just so you're aware, today we'll be going through Nana's rules, because she's the one that taught me how to play. Now these may conflict with some other rules that are out there, I will try and point that out when it does come up, but otherwise these are the rules that I learned growing up as a kid and it has always been a fun game right through to adulthood. So let's get into them. Once you've found your four players and separated into teams, each team member will have to sit at opposite sides of the table. If you're having trouble sorting out teams, then each player can simply take a card from the deck uh, with the two highest cards pairing up together and the two lowest cards pairing up together. With this done, it's time to get the deck organized. You do this by taking out all the cards six and under. So your six, your threes, your fives, your twos, your jokers, your all that sort of stuff come out of the deck. Now the other thing that I like to do is separate my cards into sixes and fives. What this is, is a scorekeeping method. So you simply put opposite colored cards, a six and a five facing each other on your side of the table. One person on the team is the scorekeeper. And as you get a point, you simply uncover a point as you go. And then you flip this over and you can uncover more points until you get to 11, whereby you win the game. Some games win with 10 points, some games win with 7 points. It's up to the players, but I've always played it playing to 11. All right, we've taken out the cards at six and under. We have given our team's scorecards. So now it is time to go through the cards themselves. Yuka is essentially a trick-taking game. So each round, every player will put down a single card with the highest card winning. And that goes from ace right down to seven. Your ace, king, queen, jack, 10, nine, eight, seven. That is the rank. Now the first rule of Yuka is that once the starting player has put down the first card of the trick, all other players must follow suit. What that means is that if the first card played is a spade, then every player at the table must put a spade down. Even if you have a higher card of a different suit, you must play your spade. Same goes for clubs, diamonds, and hearts. If you do not have that particular suit in your hand, then you can throw off, which means throwing off another suit card, which even if it is higher, is not going to win you the round. The exception to this rule and what makes this game Yuga are the trumps. At the start of each hand or round, there will be a voting process in which players will decide which suit of cards are going to be trumps. Once trumps are decided, that particular suit, say it is hearts, is going to be higher than any other card on the table. For instance, a seven of hearts would beat an ace of clubs if it's played on top of it. Okay, even though the seven is a lower number, the trump suit is hearts, which means hearts beat all other suits. So far, so simple. Highest card wins. If you have a trump card, those trump cards beat all other cards. If there are other trump cards in play, then the highest trump card will win that trick. Now where it gets complicated. As soon as a suit is decided as trumps, the ace of that suit is no longer the highest card that honor goes to the jack. So the jack is now the right bower. The right bower is the highest card in the game until the hand is over and trumps are decided once again in a following round. Simple enough, you might say the jack is now the highest card, which means the ace must be the second highest card, and that is incorrect. The nightmare for most players when starting to play Euchre is that the left bower is the jack of the same color, but different suit, which makes it the second highest card in the game. The right bower, the jack of the same suit, and the left bower, the jack of the same color. Then we go back to ace, king, queen, and so on and so forth. The same goes for any other suit. If we decided that spades were trumps, then the jack of spades becomes the right bower, the jack of clubs becomes the left bower, and then order goes back to normal for the rest of the spade pile. The thing to remember about the left bower is that when it is played, it is considered 
part of the Trump suit now. Okay, remember that first rule that I told you about, you must follow suit. That means if someone plays a seven of spades, that means you must play a spade card. If you don't have any spade cards, but you do have the Jack of Clubs, it is a spade for this round and must be played. Something that trips up new players is when they get this scenario just described and someone plays a club and they throw down their Jack of Clubs thinking they are just getting rid of a normal old card. Unfortunately, that is the left bower and they've either wasted a really, really good card or they've played out of suit, potentially losing themselves the round. So there's the cards themselves and their order and how trumps work. So what does a hand of Yuga look like? A hand begins with the dealer shuffling the cards as normal and each player receiving five cards. Once the shuffling and dealing is done, the leftover cards or kitty are placed in the middle of the table with the top card being flipped over for all to see. Starting with the player to the dealer's left, the players will make a decision based on the cards they have on whether they want this suit that is presented to be trumps. So let's have a look at our cards. All right, so there are the cards. The thing about the players choosing which card is going to be trumps is that in order to do so, they order up the dealer which means that the dealer takes this card, say the player to my left decided that they wanted it to be trumps, the dealer, myself, takes this card, puts it in their hand, and discards a card that they do not want for this round. So the players to my left and right are basically giving their opponents a trump card in order to choose that as trumps. The player to my left, as we can see, does not have much in the way of trumps, and it would be a pretty insane move to make this card trumps for them, as they only have one in their hand, and they're giving me a higher trump to start the round. So this player is going to pass. The player opposite me does have a few good cards, but no clubs, so it wouldn't be likely that they would order me up either. So they would probably pass. And over to my right, another opposing team member has no clubs and is going to pass as well. Looking at my own hand, however, I can see that I have two high club cards, the king and the queen, and if clubs became the trump, this jack of spades would become the left bower, making it a trump card and the second highest card in the game. I don't know what the other players have and I do not know what my teammate has. One of the reasons why team members are made to sit opposite each other. When you're holding up your cards, you have no way of communicating to your teammate what you want them to do, choose or play. In this instance, however, the dealer is very likely to take up this club. Putting this club in their hand and getting rid of another card, say the Queen of Spades, would mean that they now have four out of five cards in their hand as trumps and a likely chance of winning a hand. So let's go through our hand and see what that would look like. With trumps decided, the hand can begin and that begins with the player to the left of the dealer. They will start with a high card in their hand, say the Ace of Diamonds, and other players will have to follow suit. So my teammate, who is trying to win this round with me, must play their Jack of Diamonds. That is lower than an ace and it's not going to help us, but it's the only diamond that they have to play. To my right, my opponent's teammate does not have suit. They do not have any diamonds in their hand, which means they can break suit by playing a trump card or a card of another suit. If you play a trump card, any card that you put down will beat what is on the deck so far, but we can see that they do not have any trump cards, so they cannot assist their teammate, but their teammate is definitely winning with an ace of diamonds anyway. So the other thing they could do is throw off. Throwing off means picking any other suit and throwing the card on. It doesn't follow suit, so you cannot win that round. The card is basically worth nothing. So when you are throwing off, the idea is to throw off the lowest card that you can find in your pile. The player throws off a seven of spades, gets it out of his pile and doesn't help his teammate in any way, but his teammate is still winning. Now, when it gets to my hand, I have plenty of trumps to beat this card, but I also have a diamond and must follow suit. Therefore, I throw down the king of diamonds and the opposition wins this trick. Keep track of how many tricks a team wins by putting them in a pile and putting them by the winner. The next trick begins with the player who won the last trick. So again, on my left, this player decides to play a high card, the queen of diamonds. Over with my teammate here, they do not have any trumps uh, and they do not have any diamonds. So they throw off with the smallest card they can find, playing an eight and signaling to the table that they have no diamonds in their hand left. On the right, once again, our player's teammate has no diamonds and cannot help with any trumps. They throw off. When it gets back to my turn, we can see that I have nothing but trumps left. So being unable to follow suit, 
I put a 10 of clubs down and that beats all other cards on the pile. So there was no other trumps. The trick goes to me and I start the next round. I'll start with a nice high one, say the king of clubs. This is the trump suit, which means all other players must play their trump cards. Once again, my teammate does not have any trump card, so I can see that definitively now uh, as they have been unable to follow the trump suit. Over on my right, I can see that this player cannot follow suit either and that I have all of the trumps. I win that round and having gotten rid of some of the opponent's trumps, I play the left bower. Now remember, this card is a club for this particular round. It's the second highest card on the board. So other players have to follow suit as clubs. Going around the table, however, we can see that each other player does not have a club to play. So they throw off all of their cards and I take the third trick. Last hand goes down, everyone puts down their last card, none of them are trumps, and I take the fourth trick. The hand is over, my team has scored four tricks and the opposition has scored one trick. So now it is time to do the scoring. Scoring in Euchre happens at the end of every hand and goes like this. If the team that has decided on trumps or the makers have won three or four tricks, then they score a point. If they have won all five tricks, then they score two points. Now, if the team that did not decide on trumps or the defenders manages to stop the makers from earning three or more tricks in a particular hand, then they have euchred their opponents and they score two points rather than one. For instance, if the defenders score three tricks, they get two points. If they score four, tricks they get two points, if they score five tricks they get two points also. The only other way to score more points in Euchre is to go it alone. If a player decides that their hand is so good they can take on the other team by themselves, then they declare that they are going alone and play a round without their partner. If they manage to win all five tricks in that particular hand, then they can score four points instead of the usual two. So how does going alone work? Well, it's at the end of this video because it's one of those rules which changes depending on where you play. Now there are different rules out there as to how a player declares that they are going alone. Some simply have to say they are going alone after the trumps are decided. But like I said, we are playing with Nana's rules. So let's go through how someone ends up playing alone in a game of Euchre. As the players go through and decide whether or not the dealer is taking up this particular card as a trump, as stated before, they can pass or order the dealer up. The opposing team decides to pass and it gets to my teammate. If my teammate orders me the dealer up, or I them when they are dealing, then it gives us a trump, which may be considered something of an advantage. So, as soon as a player decides that they are ordering up their teammate, the dealer, that is an indication that they are playing alone. The dealer takes their card, usually gives them a look of concern, puts it in their pile, and then puts their pile aside. That team member is now playing by themselves against the opposing team, looking to get five tricks and four points. A huge advantage if they can pull it off, and a huge catalyst for lots of arguments if they fail. One other thing to note about when choosing trumps is that you're not necessarily stuck with your first offer. What happens when everyone passes? Let's say the player to my left doesn't like diamonds and passes. My teammate passes, the player to my right passes, and I go through, even though I would be able to pick up this card and put it into my pile, I decide that I am going to pass also. What happens next is that this card is turned over and no longer available as trumps, but starting from my left and going around the table once again, players can choose to pass or choose a trump that wasn't the card presented on the table. For instance, a player to my left might decide on spades, hearts, or clubs as a trump. They could not choose diamonds because that was already flipped over. If they choose this as trumps, there's no reason for the dealer to take a card. The game just commences with whichever suit they have chosen as trumps. If, however, everyone's hand is so varied and so bad that they do not want to choose their own trump, then this player passes. This player passes, this player passes, it gets back to the dealer, the dealer also passes, and then all cards are returned to the pile. The dealer then shifts to the player on the left, they shuffle, they deal, and the process begins again. Play continues with the dealer going around the table clockwise with each round, different trumps being chosen for different rounds, and different arguments ensuing, until a team has reached 11. They are the winners of the game, and they have just won Yuka. It's that easy. So with all that said and done, why is Euchre a good game to play? 
Astute viewers who have watched other videos from this channel will note that some games are fun just because of the conflict they cause between players, rather than any score or bragging rights, and Yuga is one of the oldest argument-inducing team games that you are likely to find. As stated before, players cannot communicate anything across the table to their teammates regarding their hand. Now why does that sound fun? Because everything about Yuga would be easier if you could just find out what your teammate had. So sometimes you'll be calling trumps and your teammate will be slamming cards and profanities all over the table. Other times players might decide to go it alone when in fact their teammate, unbeknownst to them, has a great hand and was really ready to throw down. Unlike poker or Texas Hold'em, which is a bit more individualized and score focused and betting focused, this is a social game. Sit around, have a few laughs, have conversations about whatever, as long as it's not about the cards that you have in your hand and really catch up while playing a simple game. Another reason to play the game is of course the educational value. If you've got younger people in your household that you are trying to teach things like teamwork, patience and strategy, this is a brilliant game to do that and a simple one. It really teaches players to use what they have in order to strategize around cardinal rules of the game and worm their way into a victory. So I hope you enjoyed that how to play Yuka, this 200 year old game that rose to prominence during the Napoleonic era and is still every bit as entertaining today. Thank you for watching, like and subscribe and send us a comment if you have a game that you would like us to do a review or a how to play. See you guys next time.